Melanoma, a relatively common skin cancer, is the most serious of all skin malignancies. As a result of our sun-worshipping culture, it's increasing in frequency and often affects younger individuals. Early detection and surgical resection are the mainstays of curative therapy. Today's guest on Health Talk is a surgical oncologist who will provide an overview on the diagnosis and the treatment of malignant melanoma. So please stay tuned. An important Health Talk is up next. Hello, I'm Dr. Eric Mazur. Today we're going to discuss the approach to the diagnosis and treatment of the most serious of all skin cancers, malignant melanoma. Our guest is Dr. Eric Dong. He's Chief of Surgical Oncology and Opatobiliary Surgery with New Vance Health. Uh, Dr. New Vance Health East. Dr. Dong is also Vice Chair of Surgery at Norwalk Hospital. Eric, so glad to have you at, on the show. I know you're new to New Vance Health. Welcome to uh, the area <laughs> and what we need. It's great to have surgeons with such specific expertise as yours. I think it's great for the patients of the area. So I'm very welcome. I'm very glad to have you uh, here. Eric, thanks for coming. Uh, thanks for having me on board, <laughs> actually. Uh, I'm actually glad that we're talking about a to topic that's really close to my heart. And um, with the summer season uh, coming on, and I think it's really important that we expand on this topic. Uh, we've been trapped in the indoors for the last year. I expect a lot of people to be going out and uh, I think this will be the perfect opportunity to try to encourage people to be mindful of things like uh, sun exposure and melanoma. You know, melanoma, uh, I really, uh, you know, as someone who grew up with a lot of moles, I was always scared of melanoma. And then I began to learn more about it as a, uh, as a physician, or at least in medical school. And uh, there are, people know that melanoma is a skin cancer, mm -hmm. and it is, less common than the common skin cancers, but it is the worst. Maybe we could even show the graphic sure. just to show how that fits in. Uh, and you can see that most of the skin cancers are uh, squamous cell or basal cell carcinoma. Actually, you could tell me, mm -hmm. but <laughs> tell us, how, where does melanoma fit into the world of skin cancer? I think it's the uh, most serious out of the three skin cancers that you described. It is not, it's the least common out of the uh, three that you described. Now, the incidence of melanoma uh, is obviously much higher in a uh, fair-skinned person. And um, uh, the two others are, like you said, basal cell and the squamous cell are much more common, readily curable. Melanoma does have a, a bad rep because of the potential for recurrence mm -hmm. and uh, coming back. Melanoma, as, an, as a practicing oncologist, back when I used to do that, mm -hmm. uh, when I would see a patient, it was usually with advanced disease, scared me to death because Firstly, at that point, and things have changed dramatically. At that right. point, there were no really good systemic therapies for melanoma, and it would it it would go anywhere. It would metastasize to strange places, you know, like I don't know. I remember the the, the lining of the stomach you know, or the testis. It was a strange disease, and it just sort of uh, went wherever it wanted to. But uh, we're going to talk a little bit. You mentioned fair-skinned people, but let's go through the risk factors for melanoma. Sure. I think there, but we even have a chart that we could bring up for that. So go ahead. So yeah, I think uh, we we were. Uh, I just mentioned about the uh, uh, fair skin. So the things that you really need to be worried about is uh, 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 sun exposure, right? The uh, sun exposure. People who burn easily in the uh, sun rather than tan easily in the sun are at more risk. Dark skin people, for instance, African Americans, about one in a thousand incidence of melanoma, whereas the uh, Caucasians about one in thirty-eight. So the darker the skin, the less the risk, the less... Uh, Seems almost uh, ironic, the more melanin pigment you have, right. the, less, the less susceptible right. you are to a tumor of the mouth. But on the other hand, uh, the, the interesting story behind this are the Australians, of course. They're sort of oh, the, yes. the Northern European stock moved down to Australia, then they, they sunbathed. And for at least a while, I don't know if it's still true, they had one of the highest incidence they still of melanoma do. in the world. Sydney has one of the highest. They have a special melanoma center and a registry. Uh, let's also not forget that uh, we used to love to go to uh, tanning booths, uh, tanning beds. They actually produce UV radiation. And UVA and B radiation both causes melanoma, even though UVB is more common. UVC is really not much uh, exposure in the, under the atmosphere, but uh, it is the uh, sun exposure. There is some risk factors with if you have uh, other genetic conditions, but for the most part, sun exposure is the most highest risk for melanoma. Now again, for a while it was said that the, the uh, blistering sunburns during adolescence were the 
the worst time, the worst mm -hmm. predictor for melanoma. Is that still true? That is still true. And uh, I also want to, you know, remind people that uh, the uh, quickest way to age your skin is uh, sun exposure and sunburns, right? So not only are you, if you, if you go outside, we could wear a big hat, uh, put, put on some suntan lotion, not only you're protecting yourself against skin cancer, you're preventing yourself from aging quickly. It's sort of amazing because, again, when I was a kid, and this is long before you were born, uh, the, the, the standard was to go out and spend as much time burning yourself in the sun as <laughs> you could. And I remember a lot of the girls would, you know, or actually all of us, we'd use baby oil, which had no tanning. Yep. Uh, it didn't prevent any kind of uh, UV radiation. Uh, people were, uh, would use reflectors to increase the intensity of the UV radiation. And it turned out all that was bad. I th uh, yeah, I think, uh, you know, we see that actually as a surgeon. So I know that the men is more common to have melanomas of the head and neck area and the back. So that's because they've been exposed to the sun, whereas the woman more common in the arms and legs because that's where it's exposed. So uh, direct correlation. But it's 20, 30 years later and we're learning the uh, yeah. error of our recommendations. So sun exposure, be careful. And we also have uh, some congenital abnormalities, but I think we have it up on the screen now, something called dysplastic nevus syndrome. Maybe if that's not that uncommon. Maybe you could say a few words about that. It is actually not uncommon in the, uh, in the European, again, European heritage. We're talking about fair skin, uh, blonde hair or red hair. Um, some people with a, what they call the dysplastic nevus syndrome, but I think a good rule of thumb is if you have 50 moles or more in your body, you need to be careful. You see, you got to see a, a dermatologist a periodically to make sure none of them are changing. Yeah, the good news uh, and the dysplastic nevi are often larger than than typical nevi. They right. may have more irregular. They have melanoma-like features, as we'll describe later. Correct. But the biggest thing is you don't you want to make sure they're not changing. Correct. And, uh, as I said, and for a good this screen, a lot of people don't realize they'll get their mammograms. You know, they'll they'll get their blood pressure checked, but they won't get their skin checked. And uh, certainly the fair redhead, lots of skin, skin, uh, lots of sun exposure, anybody with dysplastic nevus syndrome, as you said, they should have a dermatologist mm -hmm. check them over once a year. And, and some of them will actually take photographs correct. Uh, uh, of the skin. And you can't, you can't do it for yourself. And also, I guess we should say, somebody's got a, ch a mold that's changing in size or color, have it checked. Don't, don't sit home and, and want to. Okay, so d we've mentioned the dysplastic knee. Why is it so, tell us a little bit, you're a surgeon, mm -hmm. and we're talking about uh, s dermatology, but why is it so important to catch these uh, neva, the melanomas early? Maybe you could say some words so about that. Cause that actually, that's, that's the reason. You know, I actually did melanoma research when I was in a uh, medical school, knowing that I wanted to go into uh, a surger a surgical oncology, because we actually see a lot of people Melanoma, if you catch it early enough, if you're properly treated, get rid of it, it's a curable disease. 90% and above melanoma, thin melanomas are curable with surgery alone. But if you actually are late to the game, when it spreads, then it becomes a real problem. And with, there are some predictors of spread, we know. Uh, mm -hmm. So let, let's even take a step back. So I've probably got, actually I have fewer as I get older, but I probably have 20 or 30 nevi. Uh, of my body, and how do we, can we go through the A, B, C, D, E's? How do we tell if one of those is dangerous? I know, I know again, as a kid, I used to worry about it all the time. I don't know quite why. Other so than that's an acronym that we came up with long ago for people to take a look at their own moles, you know, for, at least for the parts that they see. They're supposed to see the dermatologist because they can't really see their back well. But the A, B, C, D, E's of melanoma, um, A stands for asymmetry, meaning the uh, meaning it's uh, not the same on both sides when you yeah most moles are either sort of round or oval right. and and if they're starting to look you know like uh, South America or something <laughs> y y there's something wrong there especially right. if you've seen a change from a round mole and then but the borders right they usually have a circular border and the color now the color is not always black or dark sometimes blue is very uh, worrisome for melanoma they kind of have they can have blue this uh, discoloration. And then the D is the diameter. Yeah, before they call also, I think different shades within a mole can be, uh, be worrisome. You know, yep. a dark area with a new light area or a light mole where you've got a dark area spilling off to the side. Yes. So I didn't mean to interrupt you there, no, no. but I think the color, the color change or the variability in color. Right. And then the diameter, I think uh, the way to remember that is um, um, 
If it's greater than the size of a pencil uh, nub at the end, which is about six millimeters or quarter of an inch, that's something to look, in, to look into, okay, about the size of a pencil nub. And then the E is, uh, if it's changing, any, any mold or lump that's changing really should be looked at by a dermatologist or a doctor. It's, it's funny, when I was in practice and seeing patients, uh, there were several people on whom I found a mold that was worrisome, and I remember at least one. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, you know, totally asymptomatic. The patient was totally unaware of it. I sent them to a dermatologist, and it was a melanoma. These, these you can, if you've got moles, be aware of your own skin. Yes. Be aware of it and look at it. And the ABCDEs are a perfect way, I think, to to monitor. Again, I don't think you, if you're a higher risk, get an expert. But the uh, ABCDs. Here we actually have on the screen some moles. Uh, we we maybe you could say a couple just words about. Yeah, so the one, the one on the, on the uh, right-hand side is clearly very dark, and then uh, uh, the, uh, the, there is a two-tone for the mole for that one, which makes it really concerning. And the one on the left has asymmetry. It's, com it's like you said, looks like a country instead of a circular nubbin. Very concerning. And uh, people, it's just like coast of Maine versus coast of California. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, the other two, again, uh, one is raised, very dark, discolored, with the irregular borders greater than uh, six millimeter in size. These are all very concerning for melanoma. Um, you know, I think uh, there is good treatment for melanoma. I don't want people to not come to get checked out because of fear. Uh, it is not like 20 years ago when I was in medical school where melanoma treatment is really just cut it out and that's much, right. that much about it. In the last five, 10 years, we have learned to harness the power of the immune system to treat melanoma, even when they're stage four. There is so much out there that uh, we can do to help people when they have a uh, bad melanoma. So we yeah. do have a lot of options. I, I actually, th that progress has been truly amazing. I, I just want to add one more thing to this. Mm -hmm. If you've got a mole that starts to bleed, mm -hmm. I think that's ulceration. That's that is correct. Another reason you should have a check. The uh -huh. Make sure you also feel your lump, uh, lymph nodes, the lumps and bumps in the groin area and whatnot. Those are things to look out for when you are worried about melanoma. We've got one minute left, but maybe you could say a few words. The surgeon really is the person that cures melanoma in most cases, mm -hmm. uh, but there have been some in dramatically exciting new medications for, Correct. Uh, for melanoma. You're talking about they, it's actually ones that modulate the immune system. So there's two classes. One is actually we found the key to when they have a gene defect what they call the BRAF gene. We actually have found a key for those BRAF mutants. Uh, that's one class of the drug. Another class of drug that we use is we actually activate your immune system. And we found those drugs uh, to be very effective and we really did it based on a lot of patient research and uh, consent and then they, they signed up and we found some people actually did well when their immune system is really active. That's how we got the answers to treat melanoma, metastatic yeah. melanoma. And these, these I think, uh are unsung uh, in, within the general public uh, advances in cancer therapy. They, these are truly amazing drugs. We, we learned melanoma is literally melt away with some of these drugs, and uh, it's extraordinary because I used to treat them. When we I could treat them, I couldn't treat them. The drugs I had didn't work or didn't work marginally. But some of these are truly amazing, and uh, we like, we could talk about all this I think for hours more, but we've run out of time. Uh, I want to thank my guest today, Dr. Eric Dong, for joining us on Health Talk, uh, and also uh, thank you for watching. Remember to share your questions and comments with us at, by emailing us at healthtalk at newvancehealth.org. Thanks very much for watching, and again, keep an eye on your skin. Our fight against coronavirus isn't over. We still have to slow the spread and do our part. Let's wear face masks in public. Stay six feet or more from others. Follow state and local guidelines. Wash our hands frequently and stay home when we feel safe. For ourselves, for our loved ones, for our future. Let's move forward together. Learn more at coronavirus.gov. Your blood pressure numbers could change your life. A lot of people don't understand, including myself, I didn't, now I do, uh, the impact of having a stroke. My memory is shot. When I woke up, I couldn't speak. If I would have followed a treatment plan, I would not be in this situation. It's a tough journey.
Lowering your high blood pressure could save you from a heart attack or stroke. If you've stopped your treatment plan, restart it or talk to your doctor about creating one that works better for you. Start taking the right steps at manageyourbp.org. It's a new life, but I'm going to make it better. I'm coming back. Ask your doctor. Check your blood pressure. Recent advancements in surgical oncology are revolutionizing the approach to cancer surgery. On this week's Health Talk, a surgical oncologist who specializes in gastrointestinal cancers and robot-assisted surgery will discuss his specialty. He'll describe how new techniques are resulting in more effective surgery, less pain for the patient, and a more rapid post-operative recovery. So please stay tuned. Health Talk is up next. Hello, I'm Dr. Eric Mazur. Today we're going to discuss advancements in surgical oncology. Our guest is Dr. Eric Dong. He's Chief of Surgical Oncology and Hepatobiliary Surgery, New Vance East. Dr. Dong is also Vice Chair of Surgery at Norwalk Hospital. Lots of titles. Yeah. <laughs> well, again, and a, new, and a new member of our faculty here, our new sta our staff here. Eric, so glad to have you. Thank you for having me. And you've got a, tr a really wonderful and important area of expertise, surgical oncology, and I know that you're very, uh, well-versed and expert in some of these newer techniques. Tell me, where, where is surgery? I remember surgery back in medical school, and this is probably why I didn't go into surgery. The surgeons were sort of, you know, elbow deep in gore and blood, and there were organs all over the place. And uh, it's become a much more elegant and, and nuanced approach now, hasn't it? I think uh, surgery has become more and more focused. And, uh, since I was in training back uh, in the early uh, 2000s or late 1990s and whatnot, we have developed a new approach to operate. We have started using the robot. You hear the robot a lot. You had, hear automation a lot. In reality, we have brought that into the OR to uh, minimize the trauma to the patient. We, um, we use the robotic techniques to do all the complex surgeries that when we had to make big incisions for in the past and uh, for the benefit of the patient. So they get out of the hospital earlier, they get back to work earlier, and they uh, resume diet earlier. So robotic surgery is not uh, to have a robot operate. Well, I was just, just going <laughs> to ask you to explain that. This is not to bring in uh, CP3O or whatever it is, that is correct. and have him operate on you. Yeah, robotic surgery is really you are commanding the robot uh, to operate. So actually, I'm a you know, I, I, I love automation, you know, we, we love uh, cars that drive ourselves, that drive themselves, or that's coming. The cars that are that are driving out there on the road is a second degree of automation. So the industrial robots are actually fourth degree. Fifth degree is when the robots are doing everything by themselves. In the OR, it's the first degree, meaning every movement that the robot does is under the command of the surgeon. But what it does give us to do is we have a great magnification. We do everything under the microscope. It's a fourfold magnification using the robotic 3D visualization. So imagine playing the video game. If your kids want to go to medical school now, it's the perfect time where they play a lot of video games because everything's under magnification. It's everything's under 3D, and we do micro stitch suturing. We do um, uh, uh, instruments all under magnification. I, just, I, I have had the, the privilege of, of once sitting uh -huh. at a robotic console with, uh, there's no patient there at the time, uh -huh. but uh, having a, 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 a model or uh, on, the, on the table. And I just say, I was really struck that the sort of the layout, maybe you can even describe, but I remember there was a console maybe 10 feet away from the patient. Yep. Uh, there was a two-handed thing that I could control, and there was a 3D uh, viewer. Yep. So it was almost like a VR screen that somebody would have on, and you would move your hands, and these robotic hands would move and twist. But as you said, it was magnified, so you were seeing small organs much bigger. Maybe you, you can describe better than I can, but video kind of uh, combined between video games and virtual reality is almost the best way I can experience it's it. It's at least a 4K uh, video screen, and uh, you know, it, it does. Uh, it does have advantages than we operating in the old days, where we use hands and instruments. What the robot does is actually take away the natural handshakes that surgeons have. It, you don't shake anymore. 
<laughs> uh, and then you don't, obviously you don't make big incisions because we're putting these tiny robotic ports to try to extract the uh, tumors out. Um, and uh, how, how do you uh, go about removing big tumors? I mean, in our reality, you know, you can still do big su surgeries with the robot. I wanted to ask about that yeah. because I know there was a problem back with some OBGYN surgeon surgeries with the, uh, the morselation when yes. they would grind up the tumor. Uh, they found that they ended up spreading it within the abdominal cavity. It was one how do you case. prevent that? If you're taking a big tumor through a small incision, how do you prevent spreading that tumor in the process so of cutting it up so you can take it out? It's a great question because for that, you know, the, the ob uh, case, um, it became, uh, it put a lot of people uh, at unease because of the risk of spreading. Nowadays, what we do is all uh, patients in surgical oncology at least where they have uh, oncologic or cancer that we need to take out we put in a nice little bag and essentially it's a very uh, it's a waterproof uh, plastic uh, sheathed bag that will fit through a tiny little port and uh, the, the the port sites would depend on how best to orient the specimen so they come out like a pencil or come out like a uh, Is it a ground tube. up in, inside the bag we at all? We usually do not grind it so up. It's usually just able to force yeah. it out through a smaller hole. Just that is correct. And by so squeezing. For, for the most part, we're able to fit majority of the large tumors in a small port site because human tissues tend to be malleable. Uh -huh. So as long as you keep that, uh, keep that port intact, keep the bag intact, we are able to get out big specimens. So we don't morselate specimens anymore. Morselate sort of is grinding them up. Right, right. And uh, we have been able to do uh, major cases. Uh, uh, pretty much any case that can be done open can be done in a, a robotic fashion. Um, and the robotic typically has like four little ports. We, we, uh, uh, we spend a little bit of more extra time um, to do the work, uh, but f to the benefit of the patient. And uh, we've looked at... Um, uh, the margin status or the recurrence rates and all the data that's coming out, it's comparable, if not better, because the patients usually are out of the hospital earlier and they recover faster. I was going to say, let's, you know, starting with the obvious advantages of robotic surgery is there's much less cutting. You know, I mean, again, patients don't realize this, but uh, I realized that in medical school that, you know, surgeons are human beings and you, they need to see what they're operating at. You need to, they have vis to visualize what they're cutting. And in the old days, well, the only way to visualize something was simply to open it. And mm -hmm. I remember holding retractors way back when, you know, these big open incisions. Uh, and and that, that damaged a lot of normal tissue that, that was painful to heal and could get infected. And then, again, I'm sort of getting preachy, but it, there was, you know, surgery in order to get to that tumor, you might have to move a lot of stuff around and cut a lot of stuff. So these are much smaller incisions, aren't they? And they allow you to sort of direct your surgery much more uh, in a detailed and accurate way at the tumor. Right? In, in reality, we are m even more uh, advanced than that. So what we can do is enhance critical structures by giving them, for instance, when I'm on the robot, the robot camera screen is tuned in to the color of fluorescence. We can give you a little bit of medication during the surgery, and it will enhance all the bile ducts, all the important structures in the belly. And I never thought the of arteries will look red. Everybody knows that, right? Because arteries, blood is red. But what if I wanted something to look blue or something to look green? You can have fluorescence during the camera. You're no longer looking with your eyes. So you've expanded the realm of trying to make things look different. and. Uh, so we call that fluorescence, uh, we call that, or, or we call ICG during the surgery. Um, so we have enhanced it even beyond that to, to make, our, uh, make our tumors look more, uh, a little bit more different from that. And then you, you also have that element of magnification that is correct. Uh, and, th and three dimensional magnification yes. that you're able to. Do, do you find that that helps you as well, moving around uh, various organs and tissues? That it does differ. So people, a lot of people, when they heard about minimally invasive surgery in the old days, it's a two-dimensional laparoscopic surgery. But with the robot, this is a three-dimensional one. And it's what your kids are doing you know, when they're doing virtual reality. And it's exactly it. Instead of wearing that head uh, uh, mask where we're looking in the mask, we're actually looking in the uh, machine itself. So in reality, we are seeing the 3D magnification. So... Um, and the other thing that it, it strikes me is that you can get around corners and get to places that might be difficult to get without cutting uh, 
if you were just doing it as a direct operation. Can you say a few words about that? So the, the robot has a wrist motion. Um, believe it or not, when we, when we control the robot, these uh, little tool that goes in has a wrist at the end of each robotic troll car. So even though when you're putting things in, it literally is uh, able to get around corners and go around back, where in the past it would be nearly impossible, let alone even see. Um, and uh, it has facilitated our uh, surgical intervention quite a bit. Um, we have done this already. Uh, there has been a proof of principle where the surgeons are able to operate on somebody in Europe from the, uh, from the US. That's uh, uh, where the surgeon will control the robot here and it will be a patient over in France, for instance, uh, where they did the operation itself. And maybe this will have really profound implications to underdeveloped countries that yes. uh, may not be able to uh, have their own surgeons or enough surgeons to handle that. Uh, the, um, and the, the healing, how much faster would you say somebody heals from a robotic surgery as opposed to the same operation done open? I think it's a good, good couple of days, the faster recovery. Now, the, most of the time in terms of the oncologic uh, appeal, meaning can they achieve the same kind of cure from cancer, it's about the same. But the amount of fatigue I tell my patients, you have to do a big operation is quite substantial, whereas this, the amount of uh, fatigue encounter with this is much less, less blood loss. So they get back to work earlier. They get back to their normal routine earlier. Uh, for the unfortunate patient who does need to be on chemotherapy and whatnot, they can get that started earlier to try to get rid of the cancer. Yeah, it's a striking difference. Again, I think people forget that big open surgery is a massive assault on the body mm -hmm. and takes a long time to recover from, whereas, yeah. you know, I had laparoscopic uh, 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 gallbladder surgery in two days, so it was fine. And I remember you know, those patients sitting in the hospital week. for a month. Yeah, I mean, more than, um, more than a week, I presume, yeah. Yeah, it, just, it was a, now, the other thing that I wanted to just talk about is I know in the orthopedics, and I, I really don't know with, mm -hmm. in the surgical oncology world, but orthopedics, they actually, some of the robots actually have some, uh, built-in intelligence. So when they're cutting angles on, the, uh, uh, on, the, on the, the bones for joint replacement, they can actually dial that into a computer which will guide the surgeon's hand. It won't do the cutting itself, but it will keep their hand within limits. Is there, are we beginning to see any kind of computer-assisted surgery that sort of helps you in certain areas where you might have uh, otherwise some difficulty? Uh, we have not gotten there yet with the first, uh, the, uh, the robot is actually third generation but the amount of autom autonomy is still first uh, generation. So we do have simulations where we go practice ourselves where the simulations are quite realistic, uh, where we, the surgeons get to practice on a uh, non-animate computer screen, but in reality, the computer can guide you to see where you're supposed to go before the surgery, before the pre-planning of the surgery so they could tell you where to go but not quite yet in terms of but in the, the OR. But that's really interesting, even in terms of, of setting up a virtual world where you can practice the operation. Mm -hmm. I would think, that, again, for complex operations, I know that for Siamese twins, they, 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 they've been able to that. plan this and practice it as a team. We do it uh, routinely for you know, major liver resections, especially open or robotic surgeries, uh, where we plan out the amount of liver that, we're gonna re uh, that will remain making sure that we got all the cancer out without sacrificing or harming any of the normal structures. We've got 10 seconds left. Where do you see the future of this going? I think uh, the uh, robot will, uh, be, will continue to evolve, probably not for another 20, 30 years. We still need the surgeon, but maybe in 30 years, we might not need me anymore. They may need the surgeon <laughs> Anyway, we have run out of time, unfortunately. I really want to thank my guest, Dr. Eric Dong, for joining us on Health Talk today. And thank you for watching. Remember to share your questions and comments with us by emailing healthtalk at nuvancehealth.org. We'd love to hear from you. Didn't, now I do, uh, the impact of having a stroke. My memory is shot. When I woke up, I couldn't speak. If I would have followed a treatment plan, I would not be in this situation. It's a tough little journey. Lowering your high blood pressure could save you from a heart attack or stroke. If you've stopped your treatment plan, restart it, or talk to your doctor about creating one that works better for you. Start taking the right steps at manageyourbp.org. It's a new life, but I'm going to make it better. I'm coming back.
Ask your doctor. Check your blood pressure. 